welcome to the Open Active Community Group. If first, if it's possible, just to say uh, a quick, quick introductions. Um, I'll do the ODI. We've got myself, Howard, Chris, and Tim Corby from the ODI. Um, Nathan, if you just go through and introduce, uh, just say what organizations you're from. Start with Nathan. Sure. Um, I'm Nathan Salter. I'm the lead developer at Playfinder and BookTech. Brilliant. And Ollie? Hi, I'm Ollie from London Sport. And Stephen? Yeah, hi, everybody. Stephen Winfield from GLL. And Liz? Hi, everyone. Uh, Liz Clark from Sport England. And Beck. Hello, I'm Beck from Sport England. Um, who else we got? We got Siv. Hi, I'm Siv. I'm from Iman. Debbie. Hi, Debbie Giordano from Everyone Active. And last but not least, Nick Evans. We've got sorry, I was on mute. Hi, Nick Evans from Iman. Apologies. <laughs> <laughs> We've got um, Liz and Beck from Sport England. Um, where, and where they work on open uh, on active places, so they're going to give us an intro to to that initiative. If you're not familiar with it, um, and we can talk about some areas where it might be interesting or useful to align a little bit better, facility types and place IDs being the uh, the main two. And we'll talk then about the activity list and some changes we've made to the the governance of that list, and and a query that came in about um, campaign tagging or creating custom groupings or hierarchies of, of activities. So we'll talk briefly about that later. So I will, um, I'll hand straight over if I can to, to Liz. I think it's Liz doing the talking, is that right? It is, yeah. Yeah, okay, so there we go. Yep, so um, for those of you who aren't aware, Active Places is the national sports facility database that covers England. Um, the database and the tools are free to access and they're there primarily to support um, the creation of an ev evidence base informing strategic facility planning. If you interact with Active Places, that's likely to be through one of our platforms. So we have Active Places Power, which is the interactive mapping and reporting tool. Um, and that's where the majority of users are going to access and, and, and see the data. And then that other platform is the Active Places data platform. So the data platform um, is where our site owners and data validation team are managing that sports facility data. So next slide, please. So this is just some of the examples of some of the outputs that you can create within Active Places Power. So it is a mapping and reporting tool. So there's um, map outputs, tabular, um, you can download a lot of these elements as well. But it's very much about the what, where and, and who um, as well. So it allows you to answer kind of a lot of questions. Um, and we'll circulate a brochure after the event, which um, has a lot more detail on the types of tools within that platform. Next slide, please. So this is just to give you an idea of the kind of depth of information within Active Places. Um, the data is organized by sites. So a site will have a unique identifier. Um, and then that site has a series of attributes or, or properties. Um, so you can see there, um, it's very small, um, but K2 in Quali has a number of attributes around disability, its amenities, its location. That site will then own facilities or is related to facilities. And the facilities themselves also have a set of attributes. Attributes are common across all facilities. Um, so some of the attributes like disability access, um, build history, but then you also get facility specifics and these are specific to that facility type. So for an artificial grass pitch, that's the type of information that we would record. If we'd have looked at swimming pools, we'd get a slightly different set of attributes. So there's a rich set of data there and data attributes that can be accessed openly. You can access it through our, our front end, our 
I do active places power, then you get nice kind of displays of that data. And if we go to the next slide, you'll see that you can also access all of that data through an API. So the API is openly available. Um, we do ask you to register for Active Places Power if you are using the APIs, only because it allows us to contact you. So whenever we are making changes to the platform, we will put out a broadcast and notify users if that is considered a breaking change. So we do recommend that you sign up to get those um, breaking change notifications. So we have the API. And then finally, on the last slide, so just to um, touch on the data within active places, these figures are probably a little bit out of date, but we have somewhere around 42,000 sites. They're associated with, I think it's now around 116,000 facilities. They cover 15 facility types. As I've mentioned, all of the sites and facilities are uniquely identifiable via their IDs. And we do maintain the data on a daily basis. So uh, if I were to look at the data today, it's literally as at now. In terms of that data maintenance, it's undertaken by site owners and our data validation team. They undertake rolling annual data audits. So each site is contacted at, at least once a year as part of that audit process. However, we are continually updating the data. So wherever we're made aware of a change, we will update the database to reflect that. So we're always looking for feedback and we have a lot of cross uh, support from across the sector in, in those updates. As well as our traditional routes, we are also currently looking at more data integrations and alternative technologies to support us in updating the data. Um, and then the last thing I just wanted to include there is just the open data license. So just to emphasize that it is an open data set, um, but there is the license available on the website. So that was a whistle stop tour of Active <laughs> Places. Um, so I'll just quickly open up for, for questions if anyone or, or comments, observations, um, if anyone is already using the data or, or anything like that. If, um, Anyone want to say anything? Um, a point of interest: um, the uh, the data is actually published using uh, the JSON data is published using the Open Active RPDE uh, specification, so it is in fact uh, compliant with one of the open data standards, which is which is great. Uh, and I think Nick Evans back in the day, the other Nick Evans in Sporting Women, had some good. Uh, Good uh, input on that, along with the license, which is a CC BY license. So that was aligned with the Open Active uh, license recommendations. It was previously also not that license, but again, some good work was done to, uh, I think that took a couple of years to switch it over to uh, CC BY. And so it is very much an open data set, as other Open Active open data sets are available for anyone to access using, using it and share that additional helpful context for anyone. Yeah, thanks for adding that, Nick. No worries. Uh, we, when we mentioned um, active places earlier, I think Debbie, you, you mentioned that uh, you were starting to include those IDs in your data. Is that is that right? Yeah, we did. Uh, I think it was the end of last year. Um, we did some work with the active places guys just to. Um, store their id in our world so that we could like provide them a definitive list of our sites and their associated ids and stuff like that but we haven't done anything ongoing with them since we did that work in an ideal world i think um, if every sort of leisure operator system had the ability to store that active places id against us their associated site id then it would make like the feeding of data from the leisure operating system to active places a lot easier going forward. So if we, if the, um, I'm not very good at explaining, but in my head, if the Gladstone interface for um, open data allowed us to capture the information that was needed in active places, then it could all come from the one feed. In my head, simplistically, but that's, <laughs> it's never that easy, is it? 
it sounds good Debbie and that integration is something we're working with a lot a lot of organizations with so and um, that inclusion of the active places site or facility ID within the organization's own database it allows us to share data much more uh, freely so that might be sending us updates but equally it might be that organization pulling down our data um, and enriching their database with the data that's available within active places um, so yeah we're doing that working a lot with the ngbs on that um, and with the ledger providers as many people as possible and um, to make that integration of active places uh, into other systems as easy as possible i've got, I've got a question on that oh so go on Nick. Oh, I got a question about this. That's a, that's a great, uh, great thing to, to be happening um, uh, in terms of bringing things together. Um, I wondered why, the, just in terms of the decision that was made there of the direction of that integration. So why was it decided to, um, I guess the two ways of solving that problem are, uh, it's a, let, let's say that every um, organization has, uh, let's call it a place ID or something within their database. So NGBs might have a place ID, open active data sources have place IDs. Yeah. Um, why was it decided that it would be easier to get all the NGBs to change their databases rather than changing active places to include place IDs from the NGBs database? You sort of mean like which way around? Because um, so the NGBs don't change their database in any way and that still stays with them and they retain their own place IDs. What we're supporting them in doing is adding our ID into their database so that they can use that um, information. So um, the reason it's that way around, um, I guess, is where their facilities database. <laughs> so it, um, it means if we were to do that for every NGB, you can imagine that our database would then start to get very big and we'd have to look at how do we know that we're keeping in tandem with all of these different NGBs. Um, whereas if the NGB has added it in, then it's much easier to manage that connection. If you just because we couldn't manage the IDs of every single NGB to make sure we I'm were with you. And so I understand completely the NGB IDs that are being added. They're not the NGBs in that case aren't the facility managers. They're not the people that necessarily run the facility. They're just tagging things that are happening in the facility. From the NGB, is that right? Yes. Yeah, so, for example, um, the Football Foundation um, build build a lot of their applications on our data. So they've got Pitch Power is one of their applications, and it pulls the Active Places data, um, and Pitch Power is built on top of the Active Places data. So when a user is using Pitch Power, that first set of questions they're being asked are, bit, are, are kind of like active places informed so that id is inherently in there because they've pulled our data then we can then take the feed from them on pitch quality information and use and feed that back into active places to allow us to improve our data quality but also we are currently working on an integration whereby we take the pitch quality information and supply that to local authorities so that Active Places is becoming the one-stop shop for the um, information, not only on the facilities, but also quality information. The local authority doesn't then need to approach us and the Football Foundation. That's the plan. We're just in work in progress on that one. That's really helpful, thank you. If no one else has a question, I'll jump in just with, with two. Um... Well, you said supporting um, NGBs or and you know working with ledger operators. Can you give a an idea of what what the scale of that operation is to add an active places ID to a database? Um, any examples? So we're chipping away at it with different NGBs. So we're currently working with, for example, the LTA. So we tried to do some analysis for the LTA and um, I identified that we needed some information from their database for their analysis and some information from our database. So we couldn't do the analysis on either database without, so we need to combine them. And that was where we identified, well, actually there's a lot of depth that the LTA and us could get by us linking up these databases. So currently um, we're working with the LTA, they're gonna send us their data. 
um, with their IDs. And then what we'll send them back is a list of their IDs and our IDs. And then they'll be able to populate that into their database. And that will just make sure that we can, going forward, know we're talking about the same. It's all fundamentally about making sure we all are talking about the same site um, uh, when they uh, provide us updates. OK. Um, uh, and Debbie, for, on your side, what, what, was it an arduous task adding that information? I suppose there's a kind of, is it a geospatial matching exercise or? Yeah, so for the LTA, what we're doing, we're using a mix. So with the LTA data, we're using a mix of geospatial. Um, so we're using the GIS to look at proximity searches um, and try and relate sites in that way, because obviously the names can differ and even the postcodes can differ, but we can look at, right, what's near to, to each other? Because in theory, the nearer they are, the more likely they're the same thing. So we use a combination of geo, kind of geospatial analysis, but then also um, automated um, string rather validation, if you like. So what do they call the site? What do we call the site? And looking for that pattern matching. That'll get us so far, but there is gonna come a point where we're going to have to just do it manually so it isn't so it'll get us probably we think around 50 percent of the way we'll be able to do in an automated way mm -hmm. and then 50 percent of the sites we might have to just manually verify that we are aligning like for like well wow. and, and debbie on your your experience uh, before christmas any thoughts or comments on how big a job it was um, and it just depends on the size of the operator, because for, for me, it was getting a list of the IDs from active places and then um, applying that to our database somewhere. So because we've got quite a few, then, yeah, it was quite a, a long task to do. But maintaining it going forward shouldn't be as onerous, because as you introduce new sites, when we should be applying an active places ID at that stage. Right. It becomes part of the process for adding, adding a site or facility. Yeah. 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 So that's the whole aim is we, it's a one off. We've got to do this. Actually, with a lot of the NGBs, what we find is that their data was originally based on active places anyway. So there is a lot of matches. So there's a lot of inherent similarities in the database in naming and things. But yeah, you do it once, you've got your ID in, and then it's just every time that you add to your site, you would add a site to your platform, you drop us an email and say, okay, I've added this site, we've got this new site gets it in active places and will send you an ID. Brilliant. Well, well we will move on um, and just talk briefly about two areas where um, there's quite a lot of overlap. One of them is ID, so we'll come back to that. But I think next we're going to talk about um, facility types. And I've got a, a link here, which I think is that one, to the active places data model, um, which lists, as we, we heard earlier, 15 different um, facility types at the top level. And there's some there on screen now, and those are broken down into subtypes here. And was it 60 or so? I can't remember on this page. Yeah, 68. Um, so we had a quick look in a, in a call, open, open Active and Active Places had a call a couple of days ago. We had a quick look at you know, the kind of alignment of these things. And we went back to a spreadsheet. This is the Open Active Facilities Types um, page. And you can see our full list is here in the JSON format uh, but down here there's a spreadsheet and we quickly spotted that here we have um, active places references are, are listed in our um, our listings of facility types so ac open active places God, I'm getting confused with the two two names active places has been around um, is that since 2006 I think so it predates um, open active by some time, uh, but it seems that the 
Um, there's more detail in the open active facilities types. And there are various reasons for that, but we spotted um, <clears throat> a number of challenges um, trying to kind of relate these two. Before, before I get onto that, maybe, Nick, I don't know, do you have any um, comments on the history of this kind of creating these facility types and the links to active places? Was that part, were you around for that? Yeah, sure. And there's a there's a long uh, GitHub issue, I think, in the repo that kind of details some of that for anyone that's interested. Um, the, uh, the summary of that is that, yeah, the active places list was one of the inputs into this initially. Um, and uh, and so that I, I think a bit like um, uh, Liz is saying, probably across the piece, everyone starts with active places, don't they? And then they do some stuff. <laughs> so that's that's kind of what's happened here uh active places plus some input from play finder um and uh some other organizations sport england i think were involved um and maybe emd was a few there was a few active voices in the conversation which um we could you can see in that thread history and basically that led us to uh two two lists basically a uh, facility type list and what is now facility attributes uh, facility types are, are um the well what you can see here and the attributes are things like surface type initially they were combined in one big list um but that was quite confusing because they're quite different things um and you obviously want to add the surface type attributes or attributes you add to a thing whereas these are about describing the thing um and so they've they've been separated now for that reason um yeah and uh i think when it was initially put together there was some effort spent maintaining columns a and b on this to align with whatever they aligned with on the um facility types but as you can see it's it's a slightly different lift in terms of it's it's designed for the consumer and what the consumer might be searching by which is what column f represents there um yeah Okay, I think you touched on one of the uh, one of the areas that we spotted that was different. So, for example, um, let me see. In open active, we would have something like a hockey pitch, and then an attribute which would say whether it was um, what kind of surface it would would be. Whereas, if I can find it, just here in um, the cilia types, you'd start with this artificial grass pitch. Uh, and you might find hockey under there. Um, or you might find it under grass pitches as well. So there's that kind of um, the structure of the of the of the two lists is is a little bit different. And you know, I mean, why why does it matter? Um, part of this phase in open active is is trying to move us from data fragmentation to data standardization. So we're always looking, for areas where we can we can be more aligned and build up that bigger interconnected picture of of the sport and physical activity sector. So um, being able to talk about the same things in a convenient way is is, is obviously helpful. Um, but there are some ways, some types of facility that we have in open active that don't appear in active places. Can you think? Um, of any Liz, we, we, we they came across a few the other day, but maybe multi-use games areas. I think might have been might have been yes. more. So currently, we cover um, fifteen facility types, and that is always we're always seeking to increase that. So we've got a sixteenth on its way. Um, we're just collecting data for that. So yeah, there is always going to be facility types in your list that we don't have. Um, so that there is going to be those gaps. I think whether we are talking about the same things, um, there is the potential that we could align, sort out columns A and B in the spreadsheet to make sure that alignment is clear. There's going to be some elements where that's tricky. Um, so I think we were looking at um, in your list, for example, badminton court, we wouldn't record badminton court uh, the presence of badminton markings within a hall is is an attribute. So we don't have a facility type badminton court. The facility type is sports hall, um, for example. So that would be 
one where it doesn't align. Um, it's, it's probably helpful then um, to to kind of frame the what this is for, which is the the facility use which gets tagged with this is a product rather than a a kind of space fundamentally. So it's and by that I mean you're buying a hour slot to play badminton or you know an, an hour space in a multi use games area. Um, that's the thing that you purchase. So. Uh, and that's why, because it's not space centric, it's product centric, you end up with this slightly different um, focus, I suppose. It's what is the consumer looking to buy and expectations with that. If there's a badminton purchase made, then presumably the operator will put nets out or, you know, et cetera. Um, so it's, it's, it's slightly more than, than uh, the, the space. And in fact, there is no connection to the space directly. So um, six badminton courts could be available to book but they might be in two different halls or in two different spaces within the leisure center or, you know, different, uh, there's, there's no kind of mapping to us. Um, the decision was made very, very early on in open acting not to try to take the complexity of how do you split a sports hall up? Like, you know, two badminton courts, sorry, uh, six badminton courts, two basketball courts, you know, different half basketball courts, five aside all of that in one space, we, we could have tried to represent all of that in the data, um, but because it, the decision was made for it to be product centric so that all of that complexity was kind of removed from, from the, the feed. So it was less about whether that particular half of badminton court, sorry, that particular half of basketball court could also be three badminton courts. Um, if when you book a badminton court, half basketball court disappears because it turns out it's the same physical space. You know that's the kind of interaction, but the user wouldn't know that that half bam, that that badminton court was the same space as the half basketball court um, uh, at all. Whereas obviously that that tightly that's tightly connected in the facilities data of uh, active places because the whole purpose is what's the sports hall and what are the markings on it. Yeah, okay. I think I can still see it. You know, if um, in active places, sorry, in open active data for a site that's known if a new if certainly they're able to offer badminton courts whereas previously they weren't then that might be a flag to you to say ah maybe they've, they've added markings and that's now something maybe our data can be updated so the, there's still some you know the um i think there's there is value in being able to kind of read between the two um for, for both parties i think and a, a good example of that is is, is coming up so let me see if I can get this to work now. Um, I guess how the question would be on that one is where we are. I can totally see like badminton court, why you have that and we wouldn't have that. But where we do have that similarity. So and that first one there, you had, um, we, you'd called it sports hall and it was aligned to our activity hall. So is that our activity hall? And should we both use the same term so that we know what we're talking about? Or is that our sports hall? in which case it's an activity hall, a barn or a main hall. If you see, so there's potential that the lists are different, but where they're, I don't know if this makes sense, the lists are different, but whether the same, they are the same, if you see what I mean, so that we have that yeah. common, common language that when you say sports hall, you mean all of our different types of hall. Or when you say activity hall, you mean our activity hall. That kind of, I don't know if there's something. I think, I think those distinctions between a main hall, an activity hall, and a barn, you know, which are, you know, make sense to, to your worldview, if you like the way the way your data is created and maintained, they probably don't have the same importance or, or meaning to, um, to someone in an activity finder trying to book a space, I guess, because okay. those definitions, um, sometimes it's a size thing, and sometimes yeah. it relates to the purpose Marking, originally so built for and all those yeah. kind of things so yeah um, so maybe then in really that one is all solved by column a saying well actually that aligns to 6001 602 and 6003 yeah and it is our sports halls which is all all three yeah. there is some that's a, I, sorry Nick. Well, that's what i was gonna say yeah that that it, it's definitely the i suppose because we're describing different things though from a kind of um ontology perspective you know level up to you know we've got we've got a list of apples and a list of oranges sometimes apples look like oranges you know or whatever but 
but it's almost uh, it is worth aligning them as a kind of um, one to many. Maybe that's not the right analogy. Maybe it's like different types of fruit salad, or apples, or something. Um, it's worth drawing a line between where the you know bits of the fruit salad includes an apple or whatever on the on the different sides, so that that's useful information. But the idea that we're going to reach a complete alignment where fruit salad A is apple A, fruit salad B is apple B. It doesn't kind of work because they're describing quite different things unless you have a fruit salad entirely made of apples. But even then you see it, if just we could draw an equivalent and say, oh, we found one, it matches. But because it's describing a different thing, it doesn't quite make sense to draw the direct equivalence there. Yeah. It, you're right. Direct equivalence isn't, it shouldn't necessarily be the aim. It's, uh, but we look for opportunities to to add value on either side, don't we? <clears throat> so I'm going to move on because we, we have more to fit in. Uh, but I just wanted to show this. So I have gone to the Open Active Data Visualizer and just surfaced some data from one of the feeds. Um, and I wanted to look at this example here. So we've got Pilates at Sale Leisure Center. And if I look at the information that's being returned from an Open Active feed, so this would be what's displayed in a activity finder or whatever. Uh, and this is all the information. So I can scan down. Um, we know the place, sale, leisure center. Um, what we don't have is information about the accessibility, uh, the parking and things like that. That's information that is held um, it, it can be shared in an open active feed. It's also held in the active places database. So if we had the ID for this uh, for sale leisure center, let me see if this link will work. We could return that information back from um, the active places API. Um, and that, now it's going to be really difficult to see, but I can see zooming in here that we have things like. Um, designated accessible provision um, and things like that. Accessible parking as changing rooms, accessible changing rooms. All that information could be turned via the ID just at the, at the click of a button. So I just think that's, that's interesting and to think of where that merging by place ID would occur. Um, up front in the data publisher world, to then share that information out in an, in an open active feed or in the activity finder world to, uh, to take the ID that's shared and bring in that information. So I don't know if anyone has any thoughts on that. I've been, while we've been talking uh, earlier on, I've been trying desperately to find where this conversation's happened before because I feel like it has done. Um, the closest I found, but I'm sure there's a better place to look than this, but I'll just post a link in here in the, in the chat. Um, and that is, this is a 2018 conversation uh, between Lee and I around the active places IDs and the way to reference them in the data. Now, I think there was a conclusion of, uh, and the conclusion made its way into the spec um, from that discussion. Um, I'm trying to dig out exactly where that link that reference is, but basically the reason the identifier property um, is described the way it is across all data is to allow for active places IDs to be included in open active data. And so this idea, uh, I guess, is a bit like Liz was saying, other systems already may be doing this, that you could reference an open active, um, an active places ID in the data, and then someone who was consuming data feeds could have because the, the the active places data is already in an open active uh, transport format, they could pull the open active data, sorry, the active places data, they could pull that, they could then look at the IDs from the open active feeds and they could put them together and present that uh, together. So that's a, a way that um, at least currently is supported by the Stuff. I'm trying to find out where the exact documentation is. If I can't find it, that's probably an indication it's not very clearly documented. <laughs> um, yeah. But um, but it's there in the it's in the depths of the, the 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 way it's set up anyway. So it wouldn't require any changes to any systems to to do what's already being provisioned in that in that in that sense. Um, well, apart from obviously capturing the data, but you know, it doesn't 
um, need any massive changes. I'd seen, um, let's see if I can get that to, to appear. Is that not there? There was this um, mapping here, Nick. I don't know if that was what you were thinking of, which um, is a way of displaying what's returned from the open active. Active Places API. Oh my goodness, that's going to do my head in. Um, in in open active feed kind of language, I think. But something to explore, something to to um, for us to to explore in time. But I'm going to move on now because we have we have a little bit more to cover today. So if that's okay, I will move on. And we wanted just to summarize some of the changes uh, that we made around the management of the open active activity list. So mentioned before, we want to explore ideas to improve data standardization across the sector. And I think the activity list is could be a really useful tool, uh, a piece of key reference data for the sector, helping to ensure that we're speaking the same language, we're talking about the same things. Uh, so the process the process as was, was there was a separate committee that met occasionally and had a, a kind of discussed changes to the list. And in time, they kind of filtered the way through, but it was a bit of a slow process. And, um, and also, it, you know, it's not really as open um, and transparent as all the other workings around open active. So we wanted to move management of that list to this group. Um, so it's managed in the open alongside all the other standards, alongside the, the um, RPD feed, the data model, uh, the open booking API, et cetera. So um, we, uh, we've made that change. We've spoken to the committee members and invited them to join this group um, as and when required. So we'd, we're not losing out their experience and voices um, can still be heard. So. The plan is to streamline the process, develop a, a fast track process based on some, some criteria. Um, and if it meets all those criteria, then we can just feed that change into the list. If it falls outside that process, then we'll schedule those exceptions to be discussed at, at this these regular chats that we have. But those will be scheduled in advance and we'll invite all the relevant parties to join in. Um, at the same time, we want to look at the way activities are grouped and the hierarchy structure and uh, to make sure that makes sense because I'm not convinced that it does right now. Um, but the, both those things, the criteria, the process uh, and the principles around hierarchies will we will share this group and agree them before we before we move on. Chris, do you want to jump in and, and just quickly walk through this? Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, as Howard has said, so we're looking now at uh, an exceptions process when it, in terms of the activity list. So we've got a set of criteria, um, a few basic ones, you know, around is it a recognised activity? Is it predominantly physical activity? Is there a, a governing body? Those kind of questions. It's nothing too intense or onerous to look at. If it meets all of those criteria or some of the criteria, then it would just be a simple, you know, turnaround in a, in a couple of days, whereas previously we're looking, you know, uh, one to two to three months to get a, a list um, added um, to the current activity list. So, you know, we just put together a simple process map just along here to show you that, you know, a requirement to, to add um, an activity to this comes in. It currently comes in in, in a, a Google form. I think we're looking at ways to either tighten up that Google form because there are currently no mandatory fields. So anyone can just, you know, add an activity to it, hit submit and it comes through. So we're trying to look, you know, to change that to some mandatory fields or potentially something on GitHub. But we're trying to uh, look at a few different possible ways to submit a proposal. Uh, then, you know, the next stage down. So the curation of it, you know, here at the ODI. So we received that proposal. We're going to review it against those guidelines that we've put together um, if it meets those guidelines then we just make those changes straight to the activity list and then the uh, reviews are changed and implemented within uh, the service 
and we'll obviously update uh, the the person who's requested that to be added um if it falls outside of those guidelines then it will be you know as it says how i said it will come here for the exceptions process to discuss um, any changes um uh, and then it's either accepted and then we'll make the changes and then the we'll review the change and implement in the service or it gets rejected and then we'll go back to the person who originally um raised it to explain the reasons why it's not been um, added to the to the list we do find that there are a lot of duplicated entries coming through or some very very basic terms that will come through you know that we're not really quite sure what they are so we do have a backlog at the moment where that we're going through and um, to decide whether they get added or they come here or they just get uh, rejected um yes that that's the current or that'll be the process going forward brilliant thank you very much chris i uh, i did list these um these are i think based on the existing criteria that the committee were, were going through, but we will kind of streamline this into a bit more of a decision tree, I think, to, to create that fast track process. Um, I won't go through them, but if anyone has any thoughts or comments. Jump in. I have a quick question. Yep. The point number six, is it a brand name? Are yes. we excluding things that are brand names or is it just a different process to include them? I think, I think it, this is about the the hierarchy kind of thing. I think if um, and Chris, you might have had an example in the document, but if there if it's a form of another exercise just with their own unique spin on it, then I think it should be grouped under that rather than appearing in the main, uh, the top level of the hierarchy. I think that's that's the kind of rules that we we're exploring. Uh, because I think, so for example, like um, uh, Zumba and Club of Size would be under fitness class or something like that. Exactly. Yeah. Currently, they, you know, the list is the top level list doesn't make a lot of sense when you when you just when you just look at the top level list. There are things that are huge national sports, but they're buried down three levels deep in the hierarchy in some cases, whereas uh, something niche um, and, and new is is at the top level so i think it, it's those kind of things just to to relate it um that that was my thinking um chris i don't know anything else on that um not only so far as that you know I've, I've tried to have a look at the list and try to come up with that uh you know an example of potential hierarchy of how it could you know what i mean because I think currently last count there are 709 activities on the list at the moment um and that's how i said there's the you know you it starts off what american football and then you have aerobics and ballooning and you know it, it, those are your top level ones so i've kind of looked at you know, narrowed it down to like 10 11 12 sort of you know top level terms that we could use around and then we sort of branch off but it's very much a work in progress at the moment so ones i've kind of got something together more than happy to share out uh, with the group and and to get feedback and comments from that i think so and i think um we can be informed by those other groupings that are already in place so the um the active live survey and sport england they use they have a another top level kind of breakdown which which um you know perhaps we could adopt or align with so I'll move on from that, but there was one other thing about the... Um... Sorry, could I make a quick comment on the previous? Yeah. Slide? Yeah, which is just, um, I'm not sure it's kind of in here directly, but um, maybe there's a consideration here around consumer expectations as a key driver, is the way that we construct the list. Because obviously the reason the list exists uh, as distinct from Active Lives and others is to help people find stuff. Yeah. So, the usefulness of that list, I guess, is measured by the average person looking for X thing. Can they, you know, figure it out? Um, and so, you know, for example, the brand name is a good one. Like Zumba is its own thing and quite well recognized as its own thing. So, you know, whether whether the rule of brand name or not, you know, it, it, it's almost as if there might be, as you mentioned, a hierarchy of a uh, kind of way of thinking about that, and then possibly consumer expectation and the average person on the street, if you said, what Zumba, would they be able to put that in a category at a higher level than Zumba that they would know? Um, 
and um, and on terms of that end, it might be that we could make use of things like you know Google's own um, absolutely I'm not, what it's called. You know when you can search something on Google and see how popular the, the term is. Trends, Google so Trends, and all that. There. Google Trends, exactly. We can make use of Google. Um, they have a list of things, you know, that um, that it might make sense to align to. So, but do you have any other thoughts on how you measure that consumer appropriateness of a term? Well, so Google, Google Trends being run, yeah, in yeah. terms of that, that's a metric for that. Yeah. Um, I think it's difficult because uh, different sports will know what their consumers think and so i don't you know obviously the idea of the activities committee was previously to have engagement from those sports but if you talk to someone in kayaking they will give you a very clear idea of the five types of whatever you know if you're a kayaker this is a space that you understand these are the things um so something I think, like that I think so. yeah and i think the um but having a kind of a renewed interest in the activity list which is what we're trying to promote um and taking that you know is a kind of tool to go out right. to national government bodies and say help help us refine this you know are your sports correctly labeled and described all those kind of things i think it's an opportunity to kind of engage there as well i, I will move on if that's okay because we've got a few minutes left but i wanted to ask this question um so what are the impacts to more regular changes to the list um and are there any, you know, thoughts around, I guess I'm interested in how people use lists. Do they download a static copy and, and build that into the system, you know, and periodically check and see if anything's changed? Or are they reading from a live JSON? Um, and is it going to mess with your user interfaces if there are changes constantly? Uh, one solution might be to, we have the live list, but we, we publish just an annual snapshot um so the people who want to take advantage of the latest activities can do so but those that are building like a, a slower more stable systems perhaps um can just use a snapshot any thoughts on that well, i could i could start with talking to the guidance and the way that people have implemented it when we've worked on that uh yeah. 20 24 hour updates in by and large so every they're pulling every night from the activity yeah. list and using that uh something that i'm in as a company does as well um so it, it the activity this was designed from the beginning to be fairly regularly updated you know not, not waiting weeks for those updates to come through and that's the advice we've been giving all the way through implementation um the the other side of that though is that while the the list might change new items get added things get moved around things getting deleted is a thing um and uh that I, but i think i mean there's a, there's a challenge there we don't have a deletions process or there's no way of doing that well at the moment um and so the consequence of deleting an item from the list currently is not a good one in that anything that was previously tagged with that will then disappear from search results because it doesn't exist anymore um, if you know it does, it won't get re-tagged automatically with the higher level item or whatever else. So deleting has always been difficult, but rearranging and adding is is, is straightforward. Um, the other reason that deleting is difficult is because there are situations where IDs are hard coded. Part of the guidance around IDs is that they're, they're very unlikely to change, although the description might change. The word tennis won't change. Um, so, for example, British cycling the cycling types in the list are hard coded into the British cycling system and used to publish data from there. So um, although the so if there was a new type of cycling added, British cycling wouldn't adopt that immediately because it's hard coded. Um, so for system for, for systems where hard coding makes sense because there's less options um, and they've already got some strong alignment there, it's hard coded, difficult to change. For systems where it's not the case. It's generally a nightly thing. Um, however, deleting is going to be a difficult problem in both cases. Okay. A any other thoughts from from anyone? So the the use case that we have um, is we download a a list of the um, the activities around every month um, or something like that. Um, and then we explicitly link all of the open active IDs with our facilities. So removing um, an item from that list would potentially leave a load of facilities without an activity. 
um, or cause horrendous uh, uh, data deletion cascades or whatever. But um, yeah, I, I would probably say that deleting something from the list is going to be a very bad idea. Yeah. Because we have no idea kind of how many systems are relying on these IDs not to change. I think changing the structure is fine. Um, that's not going to cause any issues. But uh, yeah, definitely deleting stuff from the list is not not a good idea. Good to know. Anyone else? Okay. Someone had asked about uh, campaign tagging. And so this is um, filtering on activities. Uh, and the specific example they, they asked was about this girl can uh, and how you can do that in the activity list and in the data feeds and so or in, in the activity finders. So here's an example of a um, a concept collection, which is basically a reduced version of the activity list. And this one's specifically uh, for this girl can. And again, it can be um, you can get this in the in the JSON format and use that in the same way. There are a couple that um, I think I did. Yeah, there are a couple that Open Active manage themselves. Oop, wrong one. Um, and there is a tool to create your own concept collections. So that's just a very quick plug for that. Uh, if anyone's got any more questions, we can we can discuss, get in touch. Uh, and the other final thing I wanted to share was just um, the data quality reporting work is ongoing. We're almost at the stage where we can generate summaries at the individual feed level. And we know that there were other requests. So um, at the site level, for example, as well, um, but just, Overall, we had 700,000 opportunities the other day um, and some decent some decent figures. I think they, they're, they're much higher than the original uh, estimates that I'd, I'd done when I'm looking at the data. So um, there's still some things to work on, uh, but just thought I'd share that there. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Beck and Liz, for, for joining. And uh, and talking about active places and everyone for all the input and um, and ideas, much appreciated. And um, I'll be in touch soon with the agenda for next time. All right, cheers. Thanks, Michael. Cheers, guys. Bye. Bye.